Uh, his film, Berlin Calling, the soundtrack, uh, it's up to 180,000 copies. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's the best fact of all. Um, that the film is shown in a cinema in Mitty in Berlin um, every single night um, for 145 weeks in a row, which is pretty special. Uh, many other Facebook followers um, coming to Ibiza for the first time for Amnesia's opening to play and to join me at Pasha in August. Um, the, uh, he's about to go global after the release of uh, a new DVD, uh, and he's playing Detroit Electronic Music Festival, Sonar, Exit, Puckle Pop, um, Melt, Rock and Sane, Festival, you name the festival, and you'll probably see this guy's name on it. So we thought it would be uh, appropriate today um, to ask the question, Paul Kalkbrenner, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> and where did you come from? <laughs> so firstly, in, 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 the, in the fun spirit of the IMS, seriously, um, so just tell us a little bit about your background, where, where you're from. Um, I'm, I grew up in East Berlin, um, before the wall came down, and um, also in the Great East, uh, to say, and um, yeah, it was when the wall came down, also we were like 14, 15, and um, there was this new thing, techno, very underground, I think. My friend Sasha Schunke and I, we were around a thousand people school, like the only two people who were interested in this thing called techno, it was like, a, like a, something very little, and then we went to like, we tried to get into part, to proper parties, like mostly it didn't happen, because we were like 15, 16 at the time. And um, yeah, that's so where I come from actually, and how I came into the techno. And I think you, you, you started DJing at that time, didn't you? Yes, because I didn't even know about productions and um, producing equipment, so everything I saw was turntables and mixer, so that's what I tried to do. Yeah. Okay, just, and just tell us a bit about um, what it was like to, to be that age in Berlin after, after uni reunification. This, um, the thing is that the real like, Berlin scene at the time it was all the people in Mitte and Berlin. We had nothing, nothing so much to do with it. It was more like parties in youth clubs on Saturday starting at 6 in the afternoon, ending at midnight. And I remember that I was not even allowed in the beginning to stay at the end because I had to be home at even on weekends. So that was not really part that we were part of the technical scene at the time. So Mitte was how it was. Okay, um, I read in, in interviews that you, 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 you don't, obviously you play your own music now, but back then you were playing other people's music, so what kind of records were you playing at that age? Oh, like 92, that was very big, like Water Number Records, Sponsor, a lot of stuff from Kent, from Belgium, and then also like, like, like Club Berlin, I don't know, DJ Rock, DJ Johnson, everything was like connected to the Berlin era at that time. Yeah, I think underground resistance as well. Also, that and also Metroplex and for sure Robert Hood in this nomination. Yeah. I think at 15 I was playing like T Rex or something. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's playing underground resistance. Um, so then, um, I believe you, you, you made quite an early decision that you, you didn't you didn't really like playing other people's records. Yeah, it had also to do with that I became 18 and this DJ thing did not really work out. I could not live from it, so I worked for as a video editor for TV stations for a while. And then, like, I don't know, when I was like maybe 19 or something, 20, I bought my first production equipment. And then it like, actually was very fast, so like the first real release I think it was now 99, 12 years ago. So, and since then, and actually, because it's saying here, you in the last 12 months, actually I see more for sure, the movie made a boost, but I see more in the 12 years, in the last 12 years, that was actually my time, so I see that. Obviously, it's so often it's a story that, you know, the, the world discovers you, but of yeah. course you, 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 you haven't been working for one year, you've been working for a long time, that's why we're here to find out. Um, so, I think in terms of the, 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 the record career, it started um, with you getting signed to what became a great label, but you were there right at the start, so tell us how you, um, you got signed to B-Pitch. Or oh, that was during the time after like 97 when the era closed, there was actually like, we call it the dark years, because then some, some year we didn't even have a real Friday to go out to listen to techno in Berlin. So, Alan. Why was that? Like 98, like at that time. And Alan started to make uh, parties called B Pitch Control, why not the label yet? And these were parties we really liked to attend, Heiko Barox and Johannes Heil and guys like this were playing there. And then she had found the label because we knew her from the parties. We invited her over to our house to listen to our stuff. She liked it and suggested us to buy something better to record than a music cassette because that was the device we recorded on at the time. But after we bought a Dutch recorder, it actually went quite fast. 
Okay, it's, it's quite a lot of DJs and producers in the audience. Just, just take us back to that time. What did you make those early records on? Uh, the recording it, it, was, it was the cleansing with the Amiga 500 at the end, like an Amiga 4000 Turbo with these tracker programs and samplers. I always liked samplers. And because I had nothing to harvest record it to, I had to make the recording like a real recording on the mixer. So it's actually the same way I still play live, even though I don't produce like this anymore. So if I have muted the wrong track at 5 minutes 40, I have to rewind and do it again. So. And that's, if I would have learned to produce music how I should produce music today, I would not be able to play live like this because it's still actually the same thing. Something runs into a 16 channel mixer and I arrange this new on stage. And you, and you never went back to DJing then? No, 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 no. Also, my whole knowledge about like records and then it stops like, immediately in 96. Stop listening to everything. Yeah. <laughs> Which is quite unusual as well. Yeah. Um, so a series of releases later, and albums, and you find yourself in 2004, and uh, you release this album, Self, which is a bit of a change of style, very melodic music. Yeah, and also not a pure dance album. It's more actually it's more for home for listening to. Okay, and um, and that led you to be um, to, to to meet up with uh, I think his name Hans Stor. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So just take take us through because. The director of, um, of the film obviously fell in love with this album and, uh, and got to meet Paul. And I believe he asked you initially, he had, he had a, well, to, well, tell us yeah. the idea behind the film in the first place. Later on he said that this album reminds him like to be a soundtrack of a not, be, not existing yet film. So at the beginning I was really just an advisor. So he had this idea, so I should give him like, like that it's authentic what happens in the Berlin label about a 40 years old director from south of Germany can't know. So it was like growing into this thing like really step by step. At the beginning I just was supposed to make one track or later on supervise it, then make the whole soundtrack and then one day he asked it. Because he also like developed the role in a little bit in my direction and it was clear for him it should not be a DJ, it should be a guy who produces and stuff, maybe even it's just a computer, and goes with it on stage to perform it. Okay, so he, you, just to make it clear, Paul started off to do the music that ends up being the start of the film. It was like three years project. In the three years that happened. So. Okay, so and, and so tell us about that. You never acted before, actually. Yeah, I had no problem to say yes at the moment, but in the last week, it would be worth it, but in the last week before starting to shoot, I really got scared. What if I, it was like not cheap, it was like it was maybe a two million euro production, but not so cheap. And I thought maybe I'm the guy who fucks it up because I completely overestimated myself. So, that was a hard week for me, so because I, I got ballots, but just then, so, and after the first day, when they said, well done, I felt... Was, that, was there a script as such, or was it a lot of improvisation? That was a... Hannes always says, only if you follow a clear plan, then you have the freedom to improvise. So it was very planned, but he always allowed me to speak in my Berlin, even though we had a dialogue, and I didn't say one word, it was just written there, but from the sense it was it. And he was always very satisfied with it. He said, I play out of the role. And because I'm not an actor, but I had the time to bite myself into it like, for what, three years. That's why I could method, do it. Method, method acting. Has, any, has anyone uh, actually seen the film Burning Calling? Yeah. <laughs> and if you haven't seen it, it has got a kind of uncanny resemblance to It's All Gone Pete Tom. Uh, but maybe just tell us a bit about the, the, what the film's about for those that haven't seen it. Because it is more of uh, the. the yeah, it's about a guy like me, but artistic-wise a bit smaller, who plays already some good shows, but his next album, also financially based, has to come. And um, yeah, he fucks it up because uh, he is partying too hard and ends up in a lonely bed. And uh, it's just for the picture, the more I don't want to see. It's the real cranky one. Um, so the film comes out in October 2008, and uh, then what happens? I still don't know yet. I, uh, the thing is like... Because <laughs> it, it came out, it wasn't a massive hit. Uh, no, it was, it, it came it out with the Cone Brothers on the same weekend, so about the numbers we had on the first weekend, experts usually can project the success of this movie, and we were drowned already. Mine was Star Wars, Mine, mine came out with Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> It's chilly. So it's like, like 
we for we so it got it over a long time. So as you said, it's very crazy that it's still running there this whole cinema. Okay, but um yeah, 145 nights is think is quite incredible. Yeah, 145 weeks. Yeah, and people now so tell us because there was oh, that was a big change in terms of the, the style of shows you were doing. Um, you left your label as well, being pitched at that time, I believe. That was 2009. I could say everything from the movie released to today, it was like the boost since, like, compared to what was before. But it happened also now in like two and a half years. So just with more gigs that time, and we did the concert tour last year. So, but was there, was there a real pressure at the beginning that you know, the first time you took that show back out and people have, now you know that people have seen that movie? Talked about that movie, the, the cult side of that movie had come. Was there? A, a, yes. They were coming expecting to see the, the the person they saw on the screen. Yeah, and, and especially also because I had nothing done before. Because I was preparing this movie, I was not so present with my music stuff. You know, so everything was waiting for the soundtrack and everything. So I didn't even know what's happening. So when we had the first week, I thought, "Fuck, the movie is ground. We run it for another week, and that's it." And the taxpayers have to pay another uh, movie. So. Um, but over time, people became to assume yes. you were that character. Yes, so actually, it took a year until it was actually by effects seen that it becoming successful somehow. So it came from me from the cult factor and underground. I don't feel, I don't feel like they like boom. You know, it was more like, uh huh, uh huh, it's still running, it's still running. So I think it was like 10 cinemas in Germany who ran it at least like 90 days. So it's still one and years. It's funny how the story filters out. Because the first thing I heard about him was, uh, have, you ever, have you ever met this guy? He's fucking crazy. <laughs> but of course, you know, <laughs> you might be. But uh, um, so, so um, you produce your own show now. Do you want to take what what the people get to see when they come to see a Paul Calvert show? I know you're very proud of it. You, you control pretty much every aspect of it. Yeah, and uh, it's much better than before. You know, you came to a club and then you have to uh, set up, but they just let you a small site where not even your mixer is fitting. So I like much better that everything is prepared now. And we have a new stage with, uh, again, from Fafi and the video and uh, light, we put this together. And then, uh, yeah, you are looking at both, but it's actually mostly everything. It's a, a, ma a massive step up from playing clubs to now arenas. It also came step by step the last two years that I actually played huge, huge stages without having like something to see. But if you play in front of 10,000 people, you cannot have just a little table. You can have some more time around it. Not working. Well, I don't know. <laughs> we but, did, but it's better with the stage. Okay. And uh, and, and, and the, the show you're, you're going to take out this year. Um, to produce a new, to, to, to show off the new album. To talk us through the new album. It's his, it's his eighth album as well, uh, which is called, um, well, I know the translation is called Me Again, isn't it? It's Ike Vida. It's actually, it has a double sense. It means Ike Vida after like three years having a new album, but also Ike Vida in terms of, and I didn't want to do a Sky and Sand follow up single, but this is definitely on my hard drive. But it was more important to me to make, go a step back to the albums I made earlier. So in particular, self, I think, is I know it's been known. Self, and even, even before that, more because it's more dancing than self. Um, but yeah, to show that it also can be very successful with just techno songs, without any way like, singing, without any um, lyrics, message. No vocals. No vocals. And uh, I think the other thing that intrigues me about you is that it's quite rare to find someone in our business that's got to where he's got to uh, without playing the politics of dancing at all. Um, and considering, you know, I think Germany is quite similar to England in that sense, that there are, there's certainly yeah. no politics in dancing. Um, and also no commercial pressures, really. Um, you're not like following up a, a massive Black Eyed Peas here or anything like that. Um, no. Are you conscious of it? You seem very, um, you're out there in a bubble. <laughs> Somehow, yes, a little bit. And it's good if the thing is about the politics. It's the best if you don't know so much about it. You know, if you, that stuff, what you successfully can keep you away from, definitely. So I just do my stuff, and uh, if people like it, the better. No, and I read a quote that you really don't listen to. I mean, like, almost every, every artist I've ever interviewed always cites someone as, a, as an influence. But um, you, you're, uh, you're probably the only person I think I've ever seen actually, write that, that you, you don't listen to anybody. You no, actually say right silence now. is the best thing. Silence is the best. That's where my music is coming from. I, but when I make an album, then I, I definitely hear nothing anymore. And um, yeah. Um, it's um, 
I don't think there's a deeper run really, but I think um, if I listen to the music, I'm not as much able to do my own stuff if I would not listen to it because it influenced me so so strong and I'm such a good copyist that it would like not be the pure stuff from without listening to anything. So but it's good, it's a privilege of people who know DJ so. That's true. Well, you're about to just have a very busy year. Um, uh, there's some incredible gigs coming up, and maybe we should be interviewing you in a year's time <laughs> to see maybe where your head's at after all of that. Um, because uh, that takes its toll as well, being on the road for you know, six or seven months of the year. Oh no, I've just played seven shows this year. I played much more like two years ago because of the Berlin calling hype came in. It was still like small club shows, affordable for a lot of clubs. They piled up. And from the, from the time we knew where it's better to have three bookings instead of two per month, just also because of the money, because I remember the times, we just filled this calendar up and ended up with like 140 shows, but I will never do again. So this time, this is like 75 shows, bigger. I like it bigger and less at the same time, yeah. And also coming to Ibiza for the first time, finally. You've never, you've never been to Ibiza? No. Until today? Until today. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. Okay. How come? Just, nobody ever booked me here before. Who the fuck are you? I think they did last year. They did, and it was like the same thing was this one. I can come steady. It wasn't the Ashka. <laughs> was that the dude you said? No, it wasn't the Ashka. It was you meant to do space, I think, at the end of last season. Exactly, yeah. But now you're here for the, for the start of Amnesia. Well, uh, welcome to Abitha. Well, I've got to ask you as well, but for someone that's so kind of uh, disconnected, as I say, with the kind of uh, worrying about what the other guy's doing, what's your feeling about um, the, the role of social media as, as an artist? You know, Facebook, you have a million followers. Are you active on Facebook or does someone... I'm not active there. It's a managed site, but it shows that you don't need any advertising. You don't even need to say in advance that you plan to release it, you just say for everybody connected there, it's out now. And that's actually mostly it. It's, um, it also changed my thinking about like, everything. Like, like when people, when, when things getting, you know, happening at the same time in so many different places in the world. Um, I never would have never thought that we would come to a so direct way of distribution to get so close to our potential fans. And it's right now on those um, social media platforms. It's great. Yeah. Are you a fan of Twitter? No. I don't need to tell the world that I'm just sitting on the toilet and I'm in the middle of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it must be better. And like the two days later, I'm successfully done. Wow. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Like, um, the other thing that strikes me is. Um, Obviously, self-made man doing your own thing. You, you, you. But uh, e even being on an indie label as cool as B Pitch Control wasn't cool enough. You, you, you're running your own label now as well. Yeah, but it's not a label where other people will, will release on it. Not our legal platform. And also, so it's a label. No one else is welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just because you, have, because you have to do it because you need to announce it and the authorities and stuff. No, also everybody on the B Pitch side agrees that I somehow have grown out of this and. Um, the things I like to my great delight to be able to do right now um, would have just have been possible in this label context. So. Why would why would that be? Because I like to play a concert just by myself and not it's all like everything is always like a label showcase and then that has to be diverted by ten. I don't know. Okay. Have you got the major labels now? Jean Pierre Lobby would like to add you to their roster. If they want to. No, we have a nice publishing deal and a nice distribution deal, but the rest we have also. Okay. All right, well, um, it's been a great pleasure to meet you and, and get a bit about your story. It's a shame we can't sit here and listen to the album today, which I did walking around the, the hills of Ibiza, which I can highly recommend. It's me. It looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you play um, at Amnesia for the Agni on the 11th of June and early August with me at Pasha. Um, for those that have seen Berlin Calling in particular, any questions for Paul? <laughs> Did he really take all those drugs? <laughs> he was acting. Hi, I have a question for Paul. I'd like to... Hi. My name's Sarah, I'm from Canada. I'm actually curious about what's in your live setup right now. It is, um, it is a computer 
what is connected to be a parallel fire wire to two fire phase 400 and I go with these 16 ins and outs analog to making 16 or 4. Do you use Ableton? I use Ableton. Berlin company. Berlin company. It's featured in a movie. As a star. No, it's actually the same on stage as like 12 years ago, but at this time it was like samplers um, and other stuff running signals into this mixer, and I get with the songs on stage like at the moment before they are arranged, so I arrange them new on stage. That's what I do for 12 years now. And so that is, I think, definitely something different in the last 12 years. I think the world's so, caught up with you, that's what it is. <laughs> good advert for Ableton, man. Mm -hmm. Like, good, it's good for them, huh? Any other questions? The man who's done it all by himself. It must be one. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you hadn't have done Berlin Calling, where do you think you'd be now? How how much of an impact do you think that had? On I think it was like a like a multiplicator of what I've done before. I think I would have brought out the same album on B pitch and uh, I would have maybe ten thousand copies sold, and I would. With the people, guys, I think, yeah, that's what would happen. Did you watch Bayern Munich? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How did you end up supporting Bayern, Bayern Munich? You live in Dallas? I am from East Germany, and not even that we weren't allowed to bring tennis balls or little matchbox or whatever it was from the West. It was not very. It was not nice. It was not. They didn't want to see it at school. So, also, it was not nicely seen that if you watch Western TV, so you. He really did it, and at this time in the middle of the 80s, the Bayern with Matthäus, Silvan Navi, good looking thing. Just happens. <laughs> just, just happens. You don't choose. Yeah. Any other questions? Questions? Oh, there you go. It's early on our first day. It's shy. <laughs> Would well, you consider the chance to do a track with Apparat or Elena Lim? What was the, the first part of this question? If you will consider the chance to do a track with Anna Nadine and Apparat. No, like doing a track with somebody, I, re I found out like many years ago that this doesn't work. I tried it with a couple of good friends of mine and ended after minutes in a huge fight because I'm not able to make any compromise how the clap sounds now. And so I, I found out it's always the best to be alone in the room. I tried last year, I called Marcus to remix one of his tracks and he said, don't go there. <laughs> Yeah, the thing is, I'm a little bit jealous of people who work together and then somebody does something what you wouldn't have done, if the other guy wouldn't have done what he just did. Doesn't work for me. <laughs> you gotta love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really, within minutes, like... <sighs> Hi, Paul. Um, if you don't really listen to a lot of other dance music, what, what, where do you take your inspiration from? It's actually a very good question. Um, I have a little bit of feeling it's more like an expressionism, it comes more from inside. Especially because I don't listen to so much music, I remember not really as a song, but I remember like folk songs and stuff my parents sang to me when we were young, or stuff I listened in the radio as a kid, you know, before you know this is what Stuart, this is this, and you make a decision because he's cool and he's not. When you listen to everything, I think this is the mix of this, what I, I think it influences you much more, the music that you listen to as a child, then in music, when you say, I'm 15 now, I listen to punk because I'm a punk. Because there is really such a message to the world. And before that time, I think this music influences the people the most, I think. I thought the other thing, your resident advisor in I read earlier, that um, you, you're not one of these people that writes all the time. You, you come up with it, you, you, you get the idea, then you go in. Yeah, it, I, I kind of much write more efficient and less more like, like when I was like 18, sitting 17 hours in the studio, it just, the buttons the are running and oh nice nice keep it keep that no no it's more I wonder what I know what I want to do sit down and produce it it's not so hobbyish anymore unconsciously one over here yeah that's alright um, you seem almost anti-industry so how did you what was your initial thoughts when you were asked to do this interview. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, 
you almost come across as anti-industry. You seem, you know, your Facebook is run by your management. You left the label. You set up your own label. You do. You play by your own rules. What were your initial thoughts when you were asked to do this interview? That, uh, that it's very good to do it here in front of so many British people, because in England it's like this. Sometimes with the techno, they were the years ahead of us. They were maybe too early. This time they're maybe too late. So I have to feel in compared, com compared to the continent, England is always like. Too early or too late? It's a different development there always. Um, I thought I'm going to have a very nice interview here. Yeah. I told him you're not all English. <laughs> he didn't believe me. Speak to English, huh? One of the back. Hi, um, I was just wondering, uh, just the way you explained that your life has kind of become like a film, and um, I'm wondering how you've dealt with life in taking art and art in taking life. Has have you felt like any aspect of since you've done the film that you're kind of seeing what was in the film is what you've become? What is the question to it? Uh, is, is life imitating art or art imitating life in, the, in that you create this film and all of a sudden you kind of become... Uh... No, I mean the Ica was in the movie, he's actually, we wanted to create him like artistically smaller as I was even at that time. Like, you know, the big superstar DJ you knows somebody who has to make a new album and uh, is happy to have four weeks instead of three for months to pay the rent. So. I actually don't have so much to do with that ego has got, to be honest. I always said interviews like 49% marks, but the older I get, not, not so much. I mean, he looks like me, he talks like me, and he plays the same music, like in this movie, but that's mostly it. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about the Ica Award. Yes. Um, you said that Hi, Ken Scott, Digital Chaotics. Um, I'm wondering, I haven't seen any videos from you, and I'm wondering if you work in the video realm or the visual realm. Like music videos. Music like. videos. I don't think that is a thing anymore, so um, I made this DVD where you can get as close to the concert by picture and sound as you can come if you haven't been there. Okay. And like the regular music video running at MTV, who in Germany disappeared in the pay TV, like at the beginning of the year, right. I don't see any sense of it. And I think everybody besides Lady Gaga makes huge minus on every music video, so if it should look like something. So I don't think it's um, other plan to do any. Okay, it was there this guy, this guy, this guy saying, did that have a good They cut it just something from the movie together because they needed it for YouTube, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody in the back of the TV. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Emilio. I'm from Spain. My question is uh, you've been producing yourself for a long time, you know, and is uh, it was your idea to make the movie? Uh, to promote yourself, or you just came out from somewhere, you know, met some people, say, let's do a movie, let's see how it works. No, I, I've been asked this question very often, like, well, why did you make this movie now to promote your album and stuff? It was actually, as I said, I was hoping that, that, that people still remember me, um, because I hadn't released something like the years before, because we were preparing the movie. And it just got really step by step. I was really asked just to be a, like a technical advisor or consultant, and everything else in the next three to four years really just step by step. Okay. I think the last thing I, I, I saw you, you quote actually, I'll, I'll just say because I think it would be a good place to finish, is that you quoted the Serenity Prayer in an interview, which was God give me the. Uh, the courage to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. What are you going to change? I don't know. How, <laughs> never change your winning team, that's really what to say. To quote something else. I but I think to, for that wisdom, everybody sticks forever. So. Okay. It's a good place to win, man. Thank you. Right, talk up, Brandon. Thank you.